Good morning. This is Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship. Just giving people a little bit of time to join the call. <clears throat> it's almost 11 o'clock on October the 13th. We're in the fourth quarter of 2024. <clears throat> this year's gone by pretty quick. Well, our opening scripture this morning comes out of Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. Commit your ways to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. <clears throat> How many times have we seen this, that people either prepare or don't prepare according to their own heart, according to what they believe, what they feel. And we see this time and time in Scripture where someone was supposed to go do something God told them to do, and they said, well, I figured it was better. Saul, the king, was one of those. He was told to go and wipe out the Amalekites. And instead, he <clears throat> brought back a lot of animals and a lot of things from the the spoil and King Agag when Samuel got to him and talked to him he said what is this I hear he goes well I knew the Lord loved sacrifice so we brought sacrifice <clears throat> and we brought the king this wasn't what God had wanted God wanted him to walk according to what he had told him to do and we get that in the word what God tells us what we should do, and it's our choice to make the decision of our heart. But we have to live by that because God weighs us out. <clears throat> so we're supposed to commit our works to the Lord, and then your thoughts will be established. Uh, the mind is a feeble thing. We choose. We do. We, we make decisions. Sometimes without asking the Lord. One thing that David did <clears throat> Many times, not all the time. He would inquire of the Lord, should I go up or should I stay? Should we go forward or should we go back? How many times do we do that in our daily life? So Proverbs 16 is a is a good indication of us in our daily lives. <clears throat> As we go to the Lord in prayer, we pray for Rita Hoffman, for Kathy Fairley, Keith Wilson's family, Lisa Hunsell, Continue to pay for, pray for Aunt Jane's family. We actually had the a second celebration of life yesterday with her internment. And it was good to see the family. It was good to hear again about a life served in love and care for family and the Lord. It was a celebration of life. And it's a good model for all of us to follow. Pray for Levi and Destiny Miller. Still, many things we're praying for for God to work out in those lives. Pray for my mom. You can see it weighing on her yesterday. In that in seven months, she had to say goodbye to both of her sisters. We have three unspoken requests. Pray for Rob and Robin Ballinger for continued healing, for continued uh, deliverance and, and restoration. Pray for Steve Rippey. I got a good report yesterday of some things that we've been praying for that God, uh, the doctors are giving him good reports on things, so we're praying for that. Pray for Mark Fairley, Sam Crabtree, and Simone Redbear. <clears throat> As we go to the Lord in prayer, if you have things on your heart that you'd like prayed for, you can send those to me in email, prayer at fgfellowship.org, and let me know if it's something you want added to the prayer list or if you just want us to keep it as a uh, special and spoken request that we pray of individually. <clears throat> but at a certain point during the prayer today, I'm going to open it to you to ask you to add your prayer. And if your prayer is according to the Word of God and the will of God, I'll add my faith with that so that God answers your prayer, your need as well. Let's pray. Father, we pray according to Psalm 122.6. <clears throat> 
Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Lord, there's many things going on in the Middle East, and there's there's people in danger. There's There are actions of war happening on both sides. We pray for peace and protection, that people could live in peace, and that the the effects of the enemy's attacks would be thwarted and continue to be thwarted. We thank you for what you've done so far. And Lord, wherever people called by the name of Abraham live throughout the world, we pray for peace in their homes and their lives and, and protection. <clears throat> we pray for workers for the harvest, people to parent and disciple new believers anywhere and around this world, that believers would be raised up to be disciplers taught and trained how to teach people and lead people and guide people as they're walking their walk. And Lord, we pray for the spiritual state of wickedness. We're told in Matthew 18, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. We bind the spirit of wickedness in our city, in our county, in our state, in our federal region, our nation, in our nation's government, our elected officials. And every place that our military is, we bind the spirit of wickedness from going against our rights as citizens of this United States and against our rights as believers. We bind the spirit of enemy from coming against us, and we thank you, Lord, that we know the enemy is bound in these areas. And Father, we loose the Holy Spirit into our hearts and lives and homes, our dens, our living rooms, everywhere that people are hearing the word of God that people are hungry for the Word of God, you would make a way, whether it's through a music channel, whether it's through uh, a message, a testimony, the Word of God, that people would hear the Word and be their hunger would be satiated as they come to Christ. And we loose the Holy Spirit into our city, and our county, our state, our nation, our federal region, our nation's government, every place that our military is around the world. Father, we pray for great revival of new believers as people get hungry and see God's people being God's people. And they get hungry for the things of God. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. <clears throat> we pray for those that are needing jobs, those that need an income shift, an increase in their income or a decrease in their outgo, whether it's fixed income or a job or promotion, or whatever it may be. We pray for you to move these things for your people. We thank you for the many testimonies of those who have received jobs, good jobs, who have now income where they were struggling. We thank you, Lord, for those who have, have testified of the goodness of God where increase happened or a decrease in outgo happened to such a degree that they danced in their living room, happy and praising you for the things that you did for them. And Father, I open this time up for prayer for any requests that people have in their hearts that's not been mentioned yet, that Father, you would hear their plea, and if it's according to your will and your word, I add my faith with theirs, that as they call out their need to you now, that, Father, you would meet their need right where they're at. <clears throat> Pray for all these names and situations that we've named, and we just lay it in your hands, and we thank you that you hear and want to, to meet these needs, and where two or more of us agree is in touching any one thing, it shall be done. We stand on the word of God for this. Amen. In Jesus' name. If you would like to give to this ministry, you can do so electronically. You can go to fgfellowship.org. That's our website, fgfellowship.org. Go to the giving tab. You can either mail a check, the address is there, or you can go through uh, the links to Tithe Leaf to either put your uh, bank account information for ACH withdrawal or uh, a card, debit or credit card. Tithely takes care of all of the um, the merchant part of that. They are audited and what have you, so that they're um, they're protecting all that data. 
all they do is they funnel that directly into the church bank account and then that's a a way you can give electronically or you can mail us a check and we'll deposit it in the bank as as normal and like i said the address is there on the um, on the web page <coughs> Our offering scripture comes from Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. God's plan of giving, God's plan of finances, is totally different than man's plan. We are told, if you scrimp and save and scrimp and save, it's out of your savings that you will have abundance. God says, if you give to me, I will give to you more. Where it says here, he who waters will also be watered himself. God has proven that to himself and proven that to me time and time again in my life. And I tell you, it, you can't outgive God. But when you give, give with the right motive, with the right heart, a cheerful giver. You're giving because you're giving to God. Not because some preacher got, uh, tickled your fancy and, oh my gosh, they're such a great orator. And, <clears throat> and or the, the kind of commercial that comes on with the sad music and the puppy dogs or the kittens. And they're, they're, they're going after your emotions. To emotionally give and people do that but it, it's not the same you, if you're giving it's because you're giving the same way a farmer gives it's with purpose a farmer gives seed into the field purposely knowing there'll be a harvest what he puts in the ground is less than what comes out of the ground at harvest there's a mul multiplication and that's God's plan, is he asks us to sow our giving to him. And when you do give your giving, pray over it and thank God that you have the opportunity to give what you give. And in doing so, you will start seeing the increase. Let's pray over the gifts that have come in and will come in this week. Father, we thank you for all the gifts and, and the givers. I pray that, Lord, as people sow into your ministries, that they will see the harvest and they will understand that you do want to pay back, pour back, and increase them for everything that they increase to you. We give you the glory and the honor and praise for the gifts that have come in and pray for the givers. Let us use this these gifts to everything you purposed in your heart for this body to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Each week we make our confession and we lift up the Word of God and say, I confess and I declare that this is the Word of God. God cannot lie. His Word is truth. We accept it. We believe it. We receive it. We live according to grace by faith. The blood of Christ has redeemed us and set us free from sin, sickness, bondage, and separation from God. We are free because of Christ's substitute work on the cross. Amen. Amen. Uh, as I before I get into the message, as I mentioned earlier, we had a celebration of life for my aunt yesterday, and it was a blessing and an honor to be a part of uh, celebrating her life, to share with fellow ministers and family members as we uh, shared scriptures, shared stories, and regaled her life. Let me just say this, that it reminded me of the very reason that I preach. The very reason that I live for God is because one day, if the Lord doesn't come back and take me through the rapture, one day I may be the one there that people is talking to me about. Now my aunt, she, she lived 95 years, but in... The eulogy, we told the day that she was born and the year that she died. And on a headstone, those will be 
on there. And in between, there will be a, a dash. That dash is the same size on everybody's headstone. If, it's, if there's a dash between there, it's the same size. Why? We only live once, and all of our years are poured into that dash, into the time between those two. And it's how we choose to live. How, what we choose to do with Jesus Christ and his free gift of salvation that matters at all. So make your dash a good one. Our message today, I guess it would have to be titled Purpose of Yom Kippur. We've talked about Yom Kippur. We've talked about a little bit in depth. There's uh, some things that I haven't said about it, but today I want to talk more about the uh, content, the current Jewish look at Yom Kippur and what they have to do and required to do. Uh, Yom Kippur finished at sundown yesterday on on the 12th of October, and right now we're the four, in the four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot or tab, uh, Feast of Tabernacles. And so we're in the middle of one feast to another. The Jewish year, their calendar year, is 5785. The, the, they list their years from uh, the creation of Adam. And so on the Jewish calendar, it's 5,785 years from Adam. The problem with that date is, looking back, it's difficult sometimes to catch everything. And there was some exiles in there, and Jewish scholars are not in agreement of that date versus um, a date that's older, a little older, because they say there's up to 200 years that could have been lost in the looking back with the... Um, with the Jewish year. So the Jewish year is either 5785, which is what, if you go to Israel, that's what uh, they say it is, 5785. It's either 5785 or it's 5985. So there's about a 200 year difference. And that also plays into end time prophecies. That's why there's conjecture and there's when will Jesus come back? So anyway, uh, the Jewish year, 5785, from sunset on October 11th, 2024, until nightfall of October 12th, 2024, was the day of Yom Kippur. <clears throat> it's also called the Day of Atonement. It's a day of repentance and the most holy day on the Jewish calendar. I know of uh, family and friends that, uh, friends that are of uh, Jewish heritage, they go to sab uh, tabernacle they are to synagogue or they also call it temple and they go and they spend their day there and they fulfill yom kippur i know a buddy that's a, a christian minister with a, a jewish background jewish heritage he went and spent time at a certain tabernacles a certain temple to to be involved why? With his God? With what God said to do in this uh, time frame? It's a time of intra-reflection and a time that God said is holy. And so let's see what, what God does say and what the Jewish people do. It's described as Shabbat Shabbaton or Shabbat of, of solemn rest. In the Torah, Yom Kippur is a day of fasting, prayer, and reflection. Yom Kippur is the culmination of the period of time during the month of Elul in which the Jews are required to take stock of their lives, to ask forgiveness from friends and family, and to take steps towards self-improvement for the year to come. For a whole month, the month of Elul, the month before Tishri, which this is the month of Tishri, <clears throat> there was a reflection, it was a time to make right anything between you and anybody else, business partners, families, friends. So there's a whole time to, to work on relationships. 
and then Rosh Hashanah came and then Yom Kippur. And between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur was the days of awe, Tashuva, which, which we talked about. It's the times of repentance where you go and you you ask God to forgive you for everything you've ever done. Even if you asked for it before, you go through and you really work through anything that's between you and God. Because on Yom Kippur, that's when the sacrifice would be made for atonement of your sins. And then if God accepted that, according to the Jews, you were forgiven for the next year. What is the proper greeting on Yom Kippur? The greeting for Yom Kippur is, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I don't speak Hebrew, so I may butcher this pronunciation, but I'm going to try. Gemar Hatima Tavo, Tova. May you be sealed in the Book of Life, or the shorter, Gemar Tov. May you be sealed in the Book of Life. Now, Christians that have been a Christian for a while have heard that term, the Book of Life, usually termed the Lamb's Book of Life. But I want to get into that here a little bit farther, a little bit deeper, but I just want you to remember that as we get to it. I read an article by Mary Claus. It's called Yom Kippur, A Time to Forgive Others and Ourselves. Yom Kippur is considered the holiest day of the Jewish year. It's also one of the most challenging. The Day of Atonement is a time to do more than fast, pray, and attend services. Apologize to God for wrongs committed and ask forgiveness. It's also a time for Jews to go to people they have wronged and sincerely ask for forgiveness. Uh, Eva Siegel in this article says, part of the reason for asking for asking for forgiveness is so hard is because it is inherently humbling to ask for forgiveness. Eva Siegel is a licensed clinical social worker and outpatient therapist at Jewish Family Service Center in Greater Harrisburg. To truly ask for forgiveness, you have to really face up and own what you've done. You have to confront the uncomfortable truth about yourself. Ed Beck, a retired licensed professional counselor, said that asking for forgiveness means that people have to admit to themselves and those they have offended that they've hurt them in some way. It also means being prepared not to be forgiven. Just because we ask for forgiveness doesn't mean the other person is going to be of the same mind. Our asking does not require them to accept it. That's vulnerability. What's the best way to seek forgiveness? Siegel said that a person should first acknowledge having done something that hurt the other person. Next, feel true remorse and let the wrong person know how much that relationship is valued. Be sincere in your apology without being defensive, she said. Own up to what you have done. Tell them what you will do differently. Beck agreed, saying that first you must be truthful and accurate in acknowledging your transgression, accept full responsibility, then offer a plan for repentance. It's never easy to apologize, Siegel said, recommending making amends immediately after the wrong is done. This is between two human beings and it's that difficult between two human beings one to admit that you did something wrong and that you hurt somebody and that their relationship with you is more important than whatever this was even though you felt like you were right but look at it from another perspective this is exactly the same way between us and our heavenly father this is a model for us to ask forgiveness for god he says, don't do these things. He says, do do these things. And then it's, we hurt his feelings. We trampled and transgressed against him. How do we go to God and say, I truly am sorry for what I did. I am remorseful for what I did. Please forgive me. This is what I'm going to do. Repentance is a continual turning, growing, and becoming. There's a, there's a continual purpose, just like a child 
they go into the bathroom, they're in there by themselves, and you come to open the door to check on them, and realize they took a Sharpie marker with them, and your nice white tile, they've been drawing pictures on the tile. You can go ballistic on them, shatter their feelings, you can find another way. I've seen some people take and go and see if they can clean it off. If they can't, they turn it into artwork. They find another way to let the creativity happen without destroying the house, without destroying the, the value of the house. But the child needs to know, you aren't supposed to do this. And until the child says, I'm sorry, I realize I shouldn't have done this, and comes and gives you a hug and says, I'll never do that again. And then doesn't do that. You know, that's where repentance and, and forgiveness happens. The goal of repenting, the goal of asking forgiveness, is not to put the other person under your thumb and saying, you have to, you have to, you have to. And I've done that in the past, and I'm wrong in that. I've always thought, hey, I asked, it's your Christian duty to forgive. Nope. Even if I ask and I lay out that I was wrong, I have to be ready that they're not ready and may never be ready. And some people never do. That's where you're vulnerable. This is something that during that 10 days... Jewish people are told to do. This is a time of, of great upheaval in who they are and what their relationships are worth between them and between God. It's a We need a lot more of this in churches. There's a lot of things that go on in churches that never get settled, never get dealt with, and it becomes a problem. Churches split over things that people never ask forgiveness for and should, and that's sad. There's a website, Messianic Prophecy Bible Project, and I read one article there, so I don't know about any others. It's talking about making amends and forgiveness in Yom Kippur. And it tells us in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26 to 27, The Lord said to Moses, The tenth day of the seventh month of the Day of Atonement, hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. Many rabbis have wrestled with what it means to deny yourself. Well, you eat on that day. You, you do all kinds of things in life on that day. You work on that day, usually. If any other day, you would eat, you would work, have relations with your wife, uh, satisfy your, your desires. And so denying yourself, they put all these rules and laws of, of fasting, they fast for 26 hours, of uh, no work at all, not even wearing leather sandals, no relations between married couples. All of this denying yourself all fit into that one phrase. Ten days following the biblical holiday of Yom Turah, the day of blasting, or Rosh Hashanah, more, com yeah, more commonly known as Rosh Hashanah, the New Year, we observe Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It's a solemn day, a day of fasting and doing no work, a day for inspecting one's inner motives and thoughts, a day of teshuva, repentance, and redemption. On this somber day, we recognize our sins and ask God to forgive us for another year, to write our name in His Book of Life, Health, and Prosperity. This is such a serious holiday that Yom Kippur is wrapped in preparations of repentance, such as the reciting of the Selakot prayers beginning on the Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah. This isn't taken lightly. This is, this is serious business. <clears throat> These special prayers are taken from verses of the Torah and other poetic Hebrew works in which the penitent asks God to forgive him or her personally, as well as the community as a whole. So you're not just focusing on repentance for yourself and forgiveness for yourself. You're praying for your neighbors, for forgiveness for them and the things they've done. 
the priest on Yom Kippur, when he did the sacrifices for the nations, he didn't just do it for the Hebrew nation. He did it for all nations, every person everywhere. Going back to this, in the spirit of mourning and repentance, it really began on the 17th of Tammuz, stretching out to the fast of the 9th of Av. The 9th of Av was the day that the temple, both temples were destroyed on that day. So it's a day of mourning and fasting. And it continues on through the days of Av, which are through the month of Ulul and then Rosh Hashanah to um, Yom Kippur, the days of Teshuvah, also called the days of Av. That period of intense introspection and repentance that lasts from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. Hopefully you've got a picture of this. Um, people will go to the Irv Yom Kippur, the Eve, go to a service that evening and begin their fast. Sometimes they start with a Prior to that, they start with a meal so that they can cover through that time. And then they start fasting and don't eat anything until the, the Yom Kippur service is finished. They spend all day in temple. They're in uh, either cantors or singing or, or, or speaking the, the word and prayers and their songs just all through the day, there's various teaching sessions through the day where they're sitting under the Word of God all day long, doing nothing, listening, hearing, thinking about their sins, thinking about how these scriptures relate between them and God and them and somebody else. Exodus 32 Verse 31 through 33 says, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people, you have sinned a great sin. They made them gods of gold. Remember the, the um, golden calf that was made? He returned to the Lord. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whoever hath sinned against me, will I blot out of my book. That's the book of life. Interestingly enough, he doesn't say, those who have uh, not sinned against me, will I write in the book. John 3.16 says that he so loved the world that he sent his son. He so loved the world that everyone's name is written in the book of life. It's what we do with Christ that blots our name out of that book of life. We have to work hard to get our name, leave our name, and keep our name in the book of life because it's our actions that will take it out. Whoever, whosoever hath sinned against me, will I, him will I blot out of my book. We don't get written into the book by works, it's by what Jesus did. We get written out, blotted out, removed by our refusal to accept what Christ did. Yom Kippur is all about this. And if the church really followed this, I'm not saying we have to have Yom Kippur services, but this introspection and this, this personal choice to get right with God, we'd have a lot less problems in in churches. Luke chapter 10, starting verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. But rather rejoice, your names are written in heaven. When we're born, our name's there. We start doing things and we blot ourselves out. When we ask Jesus Christ 
into our lives, our name is written back in because our sins are forgiven. When God forgives, he removes the removal. He removes that there was ever any sin there to begin with that took us out of the book. It's when we don't get right with God that we stay blotted out. So rejoice that our names are written in heaven. Philippians 4.3 says, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers. And then Paul says something that was interesting. Whose names are in the book of life. He says, remember, when you're dealing with other people, not only is your name as a believer written in the book of life, but so are theirs. Deal with them and help them in that same mindset. They're a human being. They're a soul. Jesus died for them too. Jesus loves them and their name's written in the book of life. <laughs> when we get to heaven, you're going to say, how did they get here? I never talked to them about Jesus. I never liked that person. Somebody else did. And they got saved. You say, no, that wouldn't happen. Go back and read about Nineveh. When Jonah went, didn't want to go and preach to Nineveh because he knew they would repent and he didn't like them. They were mean people. When he did go and preach to them, then he went sat back and said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Because they heard the word and they repented the whole city from the king on down. We need to understand what Jesus has done for us. We need to take a good look at us. But at the same time, look at others and say, they're a fellow believer. Jesus died for them too. Their name's written in the book of life as well. I should treat them with as much honor and respect as I want to be treated. It, it puts Christianity into a whole new light. It's just not, gimme, gimme, my name is Jimmy. God, you have to give, you have to do this, you have to do that. It's, are you living for him? Are you really wanting your heart to be right with him? <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 22 and 23 says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. The assembly of the church of the firstborn. Jesus was the firstborn of many brethren. He rose from the dead. He received his glorified body. Those of us that have either passed on, as my Aunt Jane had her celebration of life and was interred yesterday, and those that are still alive and remain, we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and receive our glorified bodies. We are part of the firstborn, the firstborn of many brethren. We are the household of faith. We are have our names written in heaven, according to the word of God. Revelation 3, 5 says, He who overcomes shall be clothed with white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Is your name written in the book of life? Have you asked Jesus Christ into your life as Lord and Savior to make sure that your name's not blotted out? Amen. Then Jesus himself is confessing your name. It's on his lips, confessing your name, saying, this person is one of mine. Father, angels, that one right there is one of mine. By name. He knows you by name. And he's declaring you to the Father. Amen. You, see, you might think, I've never done anything or I, I'm nobody special. You're special enough for Jesus to have your name on his lips and to call your name before his Father and the angels. Amen? 
Daniel 12, 1 says, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children and for thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And that time thy people shall be delivered. Okay? This has not happened yet. Prophecy watchers, prophecy uh, uh, scholars talk about this this time of trouble of Jacob's trouble as the seven-year tribulation period that is still yet to happen. So this is, no matter how bad the world's getting, it hasn't gotten as bad as it's going to get. But we're out of here. To coin the, to repeat the phrase of a uh, preacher friend of mine, when he toots, we shoot. When the rapture trumpet happens, we go. But I didn't finish that scripture. At this, at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. Every one that should be found written in the book. Is your name in the book of life? Then you're out of here. If you do pass on like Aunt Jane did, you are... With him, your body is still here. But when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first and they will be reunited with their body and changed into a glorified body. Right now they're in their spirit body. Then they will have a body just like Jesus has. And we who are alive and remain will rise, be with him, meet him in the air, and we will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. We will miss the need for death. We will go straight from here, straight to our glorified bodies. Because your name's written in the book of life. What happens if your name's not written in the book of life? Well, Revelation chapter 20 tells us about this. Starting with verse 11. Then I saw a great throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. God keeps perfect record of everything you do, you say, you think. Those things are being recorded. You have angels that are capturing all the moments of your life, and they're being written down in the books, the chronicles of your life. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So first, they go through your life. Then... They go and look and see, is this person's name in the book of life? No. Here's where it was, but it's been removed. Those people are also cast in the lake of fire forever. This is not judging Christians and how good a Christian you are. If you're a Christian... Even if you're a baby Christian or a toddler Christian having terrible twos in your life, you're still a believer, you're still family. Get right with God. Take this time in thinking about this is a time of repentance and holiness that God says, reflect, repent, return. Do whatever it takes to make things right with everybody you are involved with. The word says, you... Say you love me, but you lie. How can you not love your brother or a fellow human being who you can see, but say you love me who you can't see? So God wants us to be at peace and in forgiveness and walking in forgiveness with those that we live with, those that are here, so that our relationship with him can be just as open. This is what this time's for, is for us to look at us. Revelation 21, 27. 
and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, nor maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. As we look back at Yom Kippur, as we, as we talked about it a few weeks back, the high priest would go and, and lay hands on two goats, would pull out the, the, the uh, Urim and the Thummim, which one was going to be chosen for God. And the one that was chosen for God was set aside. The other one, the hands were laid on top of its head, and all the sins of the nations were spoken over that goat. A scarlet cord was tied to one of its horns, and then it was cut, the cord was cut in half. The other half of the cord was tied to the door of the sanctuary. A priest would lead that goat, called the scapegoat, out of the city to a certain place and then push it off the cliff. All the people and all the priests were standing around outside the temple because the high priest was the only one that could do the work. They stood outside the temple looking in and watching that cord. And when that cord turned from red to white, they knew God had accepted their sacrifice. While the animal was being led off, the priest killed the, the um, goat that had been for the Lord, caught its blood, and then went and sprinkled its blood on all of the different artifacts in the tabernacle or in the temple. And went in, the only time he did, in behind the veil, into the holiest of holies, and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat and spoke the holiest name of God. That's the only time he would say it. The priest was not adorned in all of his finery. He was dressed as a normal priest. Jesus came as a man and laid aside his garments of God and came as a man. And like that priest on, on Yom Kippur, was dressed as a man throughout all of his life in humanity, he sacrificed. He was taken outside the city. The Bible says that the sins were laid on him. He became the curse and died. His blood, it says that in Hebrews, how that he went into heaven and applied his blood to the uh, articles of the temple of heaven, the same articles that Moses was told to copy for here, for the, the temple and the tabernacle, the same articles there, these were the copies here that had been had blood put on them for years. So Jesus cleansed the temple of heaven and put his blood on the mercy seat. He became our high priest. He was the only one who lived the life, died as a sacrifice, and went into heaven and placed his own blood on the mercy seat. The blood for remission of sins, the total removal, not just the covering, not just atonement, but total removal of your sins. Your name's been written in the book of life, unblotted for eternity. Having heard all of this and understanding that Jesus loved you so much, he did this for you, even while you weren't a, uh, living for him, even before you ever even knew anything about him, what will you do with Jesus? I'm asking believers and unbelievers alike to pray a prayer this morning asking God to forgive of all our sins and mean it from your heart. The same way you would if you were talking with somebody that you'd hurt and you cared deeply for that relationship and you wanted them to know how much you desperately needed that forgiveness, desperately wanted to be forgiven and wanted to change. I'm going to say a little bit of a prayer and I'm going to pause in between giving you an opportunity to repeat what I said, but don't do it from your head. Do it from your heart. God's listening to your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let's pray. 
Dear God, I realize that I am a sinner. And I realize there's things between you and me. There's things between me and others. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to give me the grace to go and ask forgiveness of others. I thank you that Jesus performed all of the sacrifice for my sins. Not only did he die on the cross for me, but I believe you raised him from the dead. I thank you for my salvation. And I confess Jesus as Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Spend time talking to God. I know Yom Kippur is finished, but it's still the same attitude, the same season of repentance, of teshuva for us to make things right with God. Each week we end with the Brikit Konim, which is the blessing of the priests, this is in Numbers 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and the Lord give you peace. If you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, send me a private message. You can do it here. You can send it to my Facebook. You can put it in... Uh, YouTube as a, as a comment, or you can send an email at contact us at fgfellowship.org. I'd love to hear from you and be able to rejoice with you of what God has done in you. This is Pastor Jeff Fairley. God bless. Walk in repentance. Until next week.